Okay, so there are three causes to these effects. Autonomy and empathy are the effects. Nothing happens without a cause. If we want to grow spiritually, it doesn't just happen, we've got to work at it. The three different causes are for the three different aspects of the human personality. Human personality has a physical body, it has a mind which is the seat of our feelings and emotions and has an intellect which is the capacity to think and the capacity to develop insight. So I'm not going to cover mind and body. All right? Again, each one of these practices themselves is a, you know, a long discussion. I'm only going to touch on the intellectual practice. One of the reasons for this is because this is the, um, the main emphasis in terms of the tradition that we come from. The other reason is because this is the aspect that is most neglected. There's plenty of devotional, emotional practices that you can entertain and engage with. There's plenty of service-oriented activities that you can engage with for the mind and the body. But the intellectual reflection on spiritual truths. This is something that we lack. So I'm going to touch on this. The fundamental principle that spurs spiritual development or human growth is as you think, so you become. As you think, so you become. Whatever perspective you occupy, you grow into that perspective more and more. The more we live in a particular thought pattern, the more we live in a particular subjective perspective on the world, the more we grow into it, we become that. So the problem is that we tend to passively adopt our perspectives. The intellectual path or the intellectual discipline seeks to actively create the sort of perspective that I want to grow into later. Okay, we'll explain that in more detail as we go along. Next. Okay, so the practice at the level of the intellect is philosophical inquiry. This is what we're doing. What does that mean? So another phrase or another term that we often use to describe what Vedanta is, is sanatana dharma. This means eternal principles. Or another way we talk about it is higher values. Okay, so Vedanta is the knowledge of higher values. When we talk about a value, what are we talking about? What are your values? Core beliefs. Core beliefs? Yeah, it's a great way to think about it. In fact, the next slide talks about this. Next. Okay, so there's a quote from a guy called Rokic from 40 odd years back, or 50 years back. A value is a belief that guides actions and judgments. Why do you perform any action? Because you have a value for it. Okay, um, simple example that we use across the board. It's a very, again, it's a very grim one, but it illustrates the point. September 11 attacks. As those towers are coming down, you could imagine one person who's watching that scene and he's horrified. Shocked, sad and disgusted, all of these sorts of emotions. Another person is watching the very same scene and he's celebrating. He's filled with joy. Exact same phenomenon that they are contacting in the objective world. Very different subjective experiences. What marks the difference? Values. The core values, the core beliefs. So every attitude that you have towards every aspect of the world, whether it's your children or your parents or your siblings, your work, your physical body, your spirituality, anything, the attitudes that we hold arise from our values, our beliefs. The actions that we perform, the things that we seek in life, again, because of our values, our beliefs. Okay, let's take an example. Money brings happiness. It's a belief. I can say to you, I believe that money brings happiness. I believe that greed is good, to quote the film. Money brings happiness. True or false? False. Anyone going to say true? Come on, one dissenting voice, please. I'll say it. It's true. 
Okay, is it true or is it false? Come on now, which one is it? Depends on your beliefs. Depends on your beliefs. Well, it depends on your belief. I'm not sure that that's necessarily the case. Put it this way. If you believe that money brings happiness, does that mean that the more money you get, the happier you get? Not necessarily. So I think... To say money brings happiness, it's, it's a bit overly simplistic. We know that, okay, go down to Venice Beach, and you'll see plenty of homeless people. You go up to them, and you tell them, money doesn't bring happiness. Money won't make you happy. Uh, stop begging. Stop asking for money. What nonsense. Of course money will make you happy. If you've got shoes on your feet, food in your belly, a roof over your head, paid for by money, you will have an enhanced sense of well-being. So the notion that money can't bring any sense of freedom or happiness is, is absurd. But we also know that the more money I get, my happiness doesn't increase with it. At some point it tapers off, and in fact, if you look at the studies, it tends to drop again as the money goes up. So money brings happiness. It's not true, it's not false. It's got some truth to it, but not very much. So let's look at a second belief a second idea, a second value. Money has a limited and diminishing capacity to bring happiness. It's another belief. It's another idea. It's another value. This one is a more accurate representation of your subjective reality. It's true for everybody. It's not only true for some people that the more money you get, you don't get happier and happier and happier. It's true for all of us that there's a diminishing return. So of these two ideas, of these two beliefs, money brings happiness, or money is limited and diminishing, the second one is more accurately reflecting the reality of your experience. That's what we mean by higher values. So, Vedanta is a system of higher values. So what that basically means is that our job when it comes to spiritual inquiry is to question what is true? What is more real? Somebody makes a statement, and often we hear, say so we heard it today, for example, talk about the notion of God being an infinite power, infinite beauty, infinite mercy, infinite goodness, whatever it happens to be. We accept it. We swallow the idea without understanding that we have no idea what infinity is. So question, when you say God is infinite goodness, what do you mean by infinite goodness? This is the spiritual inquiry. Take everything that is presented to you, hold it with an open mind. Recognize there may be some beautiful truth here, but don't accept it until your intellect has understood. We are human beings. We have bodies, minds, and intellects. If we're going to exist as complete beings... We have to use our bodies, our minds, and our intellects in our spiritual practice. Our body serves the community. Our mind is aloft in devotion towards the divine, and our intellect questions everything. It's your religious duty not to believe a single word that the person up here is saying. But it's also your obligation to have an open mind to listen to him or her. But don't let anything through that your intellect doesn't say, yes, I agree. So, higher values more accurately reflect reality. Next. So, what's happening when we do this? Okay, When we are presented with scriptural texts or a set of higher values or a text which seeks to describe human life, the job is to adopt the perspective of the author, temporarily. Our job is to look for the truth in what is being said, in a sense, to try and prove it wrong. Okay, I'll give you a good example of this. Um, how many of you have heard of a fellow by the name of Chinmaya? You know, one or two? Okay, Chinmaya. Okay, it doesn't matter. He's one of these Indian Swamis, right? Before he became an Indian Swami, he was a journalist. And he went up to the Himalayas and he thought, I am going to find one of these pseudo-gurus 
one of these shysters, and I'm going to expose him for what he is. <laughs> so what did he do? He duly went up to the Himalayas with his journalistic integrity, and he listened to what the teacher said to him and was looking to where he could prove it wrong. In the course of trying to prove it wrong, what happened? He recognized the truth of it. He went from being Menon, which was his birth name, to becoming Swami Chinmayananda, which was his sannyasi name, if you know the tradition. Don't worry if you don't. So he became aligned to those principles, even though he was trying to prove them wrong. It shows the beauty of the intellect that we are helpless. When we see the logic, when we see the reason, when we see the perfect beauty, the sense that it makes, we are resolved. If we accept something because we like the way it sounds, because it in inspires a particular feeling in us, the problem then is that we may continue to live our lives according to something which, while may make us feel good, doesn't actually represent the reality of the world that we live in. All human beings have at their core perfect goodness. Maybe they don't. How do we know? It sounds beautiful. I love the way that sounds, to think that all human beings are inherently good at their core. But if I believe that, and it happens to not be true, then I will relate to others in a way which is erroneous, wrong. I have a wrong relationship with the world because my understanding of the world is wrong. That may also be true. We're not debating that point here. Unless you want to. Wait till the end. I've got lots to say on that, by the way. So as we start to question, we are integrating the ideas into the personality. As you think, so you become. But what's interesting and what's so beautiful about this is you will not let anything integrate into your personality until you've seen the truth of it. This is the key. If we don't have an intellect, as it were, guarding our minds, then whatever the person says, we will tend to passively adopt it. Why is this dangerous? Well, all you have to do is turn on your television, turn on your Netflix, and look for pseudo-guru after, after pseudo-guru, false prophets, false priests, false rabbis, they're everywhere. These are the real destroyers of religion, those who pretend to be religious and who are not. If we have that beautiful open heart and the person speaking to us doesn't have our best interests in their heart, then we are susceptible to adopting ideas that don't serve our well-being. Put something at the gates of your own mind to protect you, to protect your beliefs, to protect your emotions. That thing is the intellect. It's strengthened and it's practiced through spiritual inquiry, philosophical inquiry. Once we have accepted or integrated a particular idea, the whole complexion of life changes. Let's go back to our earlier example. If I hold the belief, money brings happiness, what does that say about my behaviour thereafter? How will that dictate my behaviour? I seek money. The course of study that I adopt at university will be based on how much money I can make. The sort of job that I enter into how much money I can make, the sort of partner that I entertain as a potential mate in life, how much money can I make. Now the partner that I choose who's going to help me with the money could be the worst emotional partner for me. The job that I take up, which is well paying, might be so against my nature that I hate doing it day in and day out, but I'm making a lot of money. The course of study I adopt at university might be the sort of thing which makes me money, but I don't have any interest in. So I don't have that, love, that beautiful natural enthusiasm, that joy of learning that should accompany a course of study at university. So my whole life is degraded now because I'm living my life on a value of money brings happiness. Swap it out for the new value. Money is limiting and diminishing. Now what happens to those areas of life? I choose a course of study, not based on how much money I can make. 
I choose a course of study based on what is natural for me. The career that I go into is now no longer dictated by the amount of money I can get, but other factors. The potential partner in my life, dictated by other more important factors. And so this is what we mean when we say the whole complexion of life changes. Your relationship, your attitude towards everything totally changes when your values change. The problem is that we are passively adopting values from the external world. We are not taking the care and attention to figure out what are the values that I am adopting. What are the beliefs that I have and do they serve my well-being? Now, we're very good at this at the physical level. I'm sure there's at least one person in this room who, before they put anything in their mouth, read the label. Fat, there she is. Fat, protein, <laughs> carbohydrate content, additives, flavors, colors. No, 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 not eating that. Not eating that. Yes, that's fine. Assiduous we are when it comes to the food we put in our bodies which makes sense because you are what you eat, right? Your body is an accurate representation of the food you've been putting into it, among other things. Your personality is a faithful representation of the thoughts and the values you have been entertaining from this point as far back as your philosophy allows you to consider. From this point backwards, every thought and feeling that we have entertained has created the personality that I now walk around in the world with, that I now interact with others with. The beauty of this philosophy, of this idea, is that we can recreate that personality consciously and using the values that I want to live my life by. See, if somebody asks you, what do you value in life? We're very good at giving those answers. Oh, I value unselfishness. I value diversity and sharing. I value spiritual growth and honesty and integrity. Well... Maybe. But often, when we get asked the question, what do you value, what are we answering with? What I would like to value. I'm not really as unselfish and giving and open and diverse and tolerant as I would like to be. But these are the values that I talk about. So a good way to answer the question, what do you value, is to look at your actions. There's a quote by um, Joe Biden, and he says, show me your budget, I will tell you what you value. <laughs> forget the campaign rhetoric, forget the party platform, where you are spending and withdrawing your money, that shows you your party's values. Where are you spending your time? That shows you the things that you value. What are you pursuing? That shows you what you value. It's a little bit like going home at the end of the day and looking at the history on your internet browser. Look at every website that you've visited over the past 24 hours. That tells you what you value. That shows you where your attention is going, not what you'd like to be. So this is what's happening. As we integrate these ideas, as we play with them more and more, we start to see the truth of them, they integrate into the personality and the entire complexion of our life changes now.